Thanks for sticking around. Oh, I sound so loud. So yeah, so this work is a, a dark matter axion direct detection proposal, um, make, taking advantage of a special phase of superfluid helium-3 um, called homogeneous precession domain. So is does anyone hear of this? <laughs> oh no, you never heard of this? Okay, good. We'll spend some time on this, right. Okay, so this should work. Yes, it works. So yeah, this is just a slide showing. We have no idea what dark matter is. Um, and this workshop, since we're doing Axial, um, and it's a way, uh, we, we've heard the occupation number is really high. So we can think of Axial dark matter as a classical field. And this is the approximation we are gonna take in this talk. Okay. And then we're gonna be, um, Actually, let me show you later. And then let's see. Wow. All right. So, a few just to recap some basic features of this wave like dark matter. Like I said, there's a large occupation number and it's cold dark matter. So, in particular, the local dark matter is virilized with the Milky Way galaxy with a viral velocity around. Um, 10 to the minus 3c. So it's very non-relativistic, however, it still has a non-zero velocity. And this is the feature we're going to take advantage. Um, right, let's see. In particular, you can write it in this form. This axion field takes a uh, amplitude. I write it as A0. And this A0 is set at the um, dark matter density. Um, so for a fixed, Axion mass, you get a prediction for A0 um, given rho dark matter is fixed. And then there is this phase term inside the um, cosine or the oscillation. Uh, the oscillation here goes like the mass times the time minus this term, right? This is the momentum of the axion times the uh, position. So this term usually in dark matter halo scope, you ignore it because they're not sensitive to this. However, in this talk, we are going to rely on this term. So I leave it here. Um, all right, next slide. So the outline of this talk is we're going to do direct detection, making um, use of the axion nucleon coupling. Unlike the dark matter halo scope, usually that relies on axion photon coupling. This one, we assume an axion nuclear coupling. And the technique we're going to do is a nuclear magnetic resonance. And um, um, the next part, we're going to um, talk a little bit about helium-3, in particular, introducing this special phase, homogeneous precession domain. And last, we give some projected sensitivity combining these technologies. Um, this is um, um, the conceptual sort of work was published in PRL last year, uh, last year, yeah. And then we're doing more like uh, rigorous simulations, treating the signal more carefully. Um, the collaboration includes um, these three people. There are um, helium-3 experimentalists based in Northwestern, and then phenomenologists like me and uh, Yoni, um, Josh Foster, Yen, and, um, and these are other um, AMO physicist based at UIUC, okay? All right, let's see. All right, axion nuclear coupling. Effectively, this is the, GAN is the dimensionful um, interaction. It has a dimension of one over mass, right? So in particular, we can write it in this form. FA is the um, breaking scale for axion. Um, the Petri Queen symmetry and the CN is um, sort of a model dependent parameter. So here we're just gonna treat CN. So depending on whether it's a proton nucleon, CN could be different in different models. So here we're gonna treat them as a universal coupling between protons and nucleons. So this part is uh, a derived coupling between axion and the nucleus. Okay, so, so this coupling allows you already to probe axion like we heard earlier today in Ben's talk, um, because in stars, if you have a large baryon density, you can branch out on axions, and that will make the star cools faster than it should be. For example, in this paper, they look at some 
you know, photon flux of a particular neutron star and was able to place a 10 to the minus 10 inverse GeV um, constraint on the axion neutron coupling for axion mass all the way down from 10 keV. So this is a very, very powerful probe. Um, right, so another thing about this coupling is that it allows you to um, take advantage of nuclear magnetic resonance and in particular, if you, so since we're now doing laboratory-based experiments, these nuclears are sitting at rest, okay? So the velocity of these, these nuclears are approximately zero. So this, um, so if you notice here, the, there is two term, right? There is the time derivative term acting on axiom, but that term unfortunately is proportional to the velocity of these nucleons. So that is negligible in lab. However, there is the gradient term of the axion, which is proportional to the axion field itself, the axion velocity. Um, but the, the gamma i is a secretly a sigma matrix, right? So this gradient field actually couples to the spin of the nuclear. And if you write on a low energy uh, effective Hamiltonian, this is the effective Hamiltonian S is roughly the spin of the nuclear. And this term GAN times gradient of A acts as a effective magnetic field induced by the dark matter axion. So just to put in some numbers, how small is this effective field from dark matter? Putting in GAN taking 10 to the minus 10 inverse GV, we get uh, 10 to the minus 16 um, Tesla. So it's a really, really small field. However, um, we know NMR could be very powerful. So we're hoping that even though we're suppressed by the velocity of the axion field, we could stake, um, still do something. Okay, so in the axion direct detection. Let's see, just to recap the NMR technique. So I assume most of you forgot <laughs> how NMR works. Okay, just bear with me if this is too fundamental. So it works this way for, um, material, this is a broad, um, material, um, if you put it in a, a static magnetic field, usually we call it a bias field in this Z direction. Um, the, the material, because it has a um, geomagnetic ratio, uh, this is the gamma, the geomagnetic ratio is material dependent. It could, um, there is a intrinsic frequency of this material called lama frequency here. Okay, so, by tuning um, the B0, the bias field, you could change this lama frequency. Um, the N will work this way. If you put a bias field on top of it, apply an os os oscillating field perpendicular to this bias field right, in this direction. So now if the oscillation frequency omega matches the, oh, did I say, sorry. If the oscillation frequency omega matches the lama frequency, you get the um, the the magnetic the magnetization of this material is going to tip away from this B zero. Okay, so this is a signal in an NMR. So you can imagine we just said the the axion acts as an oscillating background field. So this has a natural frequency sitting at um, axial mass. So now imagine you can tune this B0 until the lama frequency of this block matches the axial frequency, then you get an NMR signal. So this is the essence in CASPA, which was um, first proposed by this paper in 2013. Right, so we just said, so this version is um, continuous NMR. In this talk, we're going to do a pulsed NMR type of experiment. So it's a similar idea. There is a B bias field in the Z direction. At time t equals zero, we can send a um, RF pulse in the XY direction. So that will tip all the spins away from the Z direction. And then you just watch how the system relax over time. So this um, is the magnetization trajectory over time. Um, it starts to process around the B0 and eventually get relaxed and be in the equilibrium position, which is to be aligned with the B0. 
So one can plot the magnetization along the Z direction, MZ here is the black curve, and then the magnetization in the XY plane here as the blue curve. In particular, there are two time scales uh, um, which are important that are related to the relaxation of the system. So in the um, condensed matter, we call it T1, T2. So T1 is usually called the spin lattice relaxation, and that's to do with um, the vibrational modes of this, um, material, of this uh, material. So T2 is, as you can see, is shorter than T1, and it controls the dephasing. So T2 exists the, um, alone um, without the magnetic field, okay? So this is the limiting factor in a lot of NMR experiments because you cannot forbid um, collision or impurities in a, um, in a system. Uh, right, so um, T1, T2 are intrinsically not related, um, in principle not related, and then T2 limits the performance of NMR. So later we'll see in this special domain, T2 and T1 are locked together actually. So that is one feature of that special domain we're going to see. Right, so um, right to motivate Axiom, search using NMR. Um, in the in relying on this coupling, uh, and to, uh, there are lo already lots of experiments going on in this plane, and there are lots of star cooling, right? Like I said, the strongest bonds actually still coming from star cooling in the axial nuclear coupling. And so today we're going to roughly focus here at 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 7 EV um, um, range, and this is basically determined by the lama frequency of the helium-3 we're going to use, right? Okay, so before we proceed, we have to understand how this works, right? So um, uh, helium-3, first of all, it's a spin half, so it's a fermion because it has two protons, two electrons, one neutron, right? so it's odd number for, uh, uh, for uh, half spin half particles. So um, so it behaves very, very different from its helium-3 isotope, right? At low temperature, um, still you can form superfluid phase, which is a roughly like a, a sort of similar to a BEC idea. So here is, a, let's see what I get. Right, okay. So here is a phase diagram for helium-3. So. Um, temperature is on the horizontal axis and pressure here. So here is the normal Fermi liquid, but if you're below a certain temperature, you enter the superfluid phase. And um, um, it, it says B liquid here, and then there's special, like a, a, a small section of A liquid. Okay, so what, what happens here? Well, the reason is um, superfluid phase is a bit like we said, um, these are fermions, so how do they enter the superfluid? They have to form Cooper pairs, right? Just like superconductor. However, let me let's re, let's remember in superconductor, the electrons are forming the Cooper pairs. But electrons are elementary particles, right? They have no internal structure. So the only in the particle physics language, when the superconducting phase happens, you are spontaneously breaking a U1 gauge symmetry, and that's it, right? That determines your superconducting phase. However, here we're dealing with helium three atoms. They have, um, they are composite objects. In particular, they have not only spin, but also they could have angular momentum. Okay, so when you, if you take a pair of helium-3 atoms, um, the total spin could, is, it turns out, the, the Cooper pairs choose the spin equals one and P wave pairing. Uh, and this is termed by the spin statistics just because when you exchange a pair of fermions, you need to get odd wave functions and this allows you to have that, right? Okay, so when you, uh, unbroken phase has the SO3 times SO3 symmetry, right? However, in the broken phase, again, not only you break the U1 gauge symmetry, now you start to break these internal symmetries. Okay, so the A and the B phase are related to how the spontaneous broken is happening to these S uh, SO3 times SO3. So the B phase um, is 
the B phase we're going to use. It happens is what happens is SO3 times SO3 spontaneously broken to SO3J. J is the sum of L plus S. Okay, so for example, these little this one of them represents S, the other represents L. If you put them together, there is a, still an overall J that is free to rotate in my um, bulk uh, liquid. Okay, so you can think of this as a free vector field, right? So um, yeah, a vector field in this um, B phase. And so A phase actually breaks more symmetry. Not only the J, um, this individual S and L is broken, but now J, they all wants to be aligned in the same angle. So A phase is even um, more broken than B phase. Right, so these are the special part of the superfluid part of helium three, all right? So we haven't explained the homogeneous precession domain. Oh yeah. So another, you often hear people talking about magnals and stuff like that. So let's just uh, connect the, the words. Um, uh, the spin, and because you, you, you have the spins with, associated with each helium, you can send spin waves in this material. And the quasi particle associated with spin wave is called magnon, right? So in this superfluid phase, um, the magnum forms a BEC. That's another way of talking about this phase. Right. Okay, so now we're going to, we covered the superfluid helium three and what is B phase like. Now we have to explain the homogeneous precession domain part. Okay, this is first, um, is actually, first of all, experimentally established and then people use special theories to explain why they observe this uh, phenomenon. And this work was done back in, you know, 80s by Russian physicists, <laughs> not surprisingly. So all the, when we go through the literature of this, all the uh, references are really old and they are translated into like JETP from Russian, <laughs> um, um, arc, uh, you know, journals. So this is the experiments what it was um, being done, all right? So here is a bulk of uh, superfluid helium in B phase, and uh, we're going to do a pulsed NMR experiments with that. There is a bias field in the Z direction. Okay, so here I allow a small gradient along the B field. So the B field is larger here, a little, little smaller, a um, little smaller above. Okay, at T equals zero, I send an RS, uh, RF pulse in the XY plane. So now it tips all the spins into the XY direction. So Remember the magnon corresponds to the quasi-particle of spin waves. So this is essentially, you can think of them of sending, depending on the size of this RF pulse, this is sending N magnons, injecting N magnons into this um, fluid. T equals zero, they are randomly oriented, but because we're in the superfluid phase, if you wait uh, 20 milliseconds here on this picture, this is what you observe. Okay, so first of all, it forms two domains. There is um, this domain down with a little lar larger magnetic field where all the spins are just in the equilibrium position. And then there is another domain above it where all the spins are processing at the same frequency along the Z direction at a fixed angle, approximately fixed angle, okay? And what is this angle? You can predict it, uh, which is, predicted by Tony Leggett at UIUC, and that was the reason he won a Nobel Prize. Um, this is the angle and the frequent, what is the frequency? So frequency is the lama frequency corresponding to where this domain wall is. So this two domain theory was per, per, um, proposed in this paper. Okay, so this phenomenon is known as the homogeneous precession domain in helium three um, uh, um, B. As far as I know, there's no other um, fluid that exhibits this behavior. Right, so let's look at a um, little bit more. Yeah, here I want to explain why they are processing at the same frequency with a little bit more details. Uh, first of all, um, there are a couple of angles I didn't explain. So remember B, we're in the, we still have a symmetry of SO3J, right? So we have three degrees of freedom. 
you can use, oh, can I use? Oh, yeah. So you can use three Euler angles to represent these three degrees of freedom. Um, the first angle is beta, which is here, right? So beta is the azimuthal angle tipping away from my z direction. Okay, another angle is associated with precession in the xy plane, and let's call it alpha. And a third angle is the precession along the direction of that spin. So this is my three angle alpha, beta, um, phi. phi. Phi is this angle. Okay, so, right. So it turns out the, the frequency or the free energy not only depends on the external B field, as we just said, um, um, is like a Zeeman energy, but also there is a dipole coupling. And this is a self-interaction between spins. And this is extremely weak and you don't even consider it in the normal phase. However, when you cool the whole thing down to millikelvin, the self-interaction starts to actually become important. So in particular, this acts in this way, right? So there is a dipole energy and it depends on beta. And uh, in fact, if you plot it, um, plot this um, omega z in the, in the function of cosine beta and phi, this is what you find, right? So here, if you look here, there's this, this curve is giving you the minimum of the potential energy for the system. So, and this is why it splits into two dom domains, okay? So, so below, below this um, point, let's call uh, here the, the llama frequency, right? So below here, the gradient points this way, right? The B field is larger. So your, so B field is larger. If you want to minimize your potential uh, frequency or potential free energy, you have to, um, um, move along this direction, okay? But this this doesn't allow you to do it. So you're, you're stuck here. But above here, you see you can move here, right? So you move along the bottom of this line, but phi doesn't really enter your free, free energy. So basically above here, you can compensate the changing in the gradient B field by, a, by a, adjusting the beta, okay? So this is a microscopic description of this splitting of two domains. Um, right, so I found this uh, very interesting. <laughs> Let's see what else. Oh yeah, so just to um, go through the actual signals. So we said after two, um, 20 milliseconds, they can form two domains and then we watch how it relaxes. okay? So um, when it relaxes. Remember before in an usual pulse NMR experiment, the T1, T2 are two independent parameters. The, the magnetization along the, the longitudinal magnetization and the transverse magnetization are sort of independently relaxing. But here they are fixed by that special angle, minus one a quarter, right? Cosine beta is minus quarter. So there are, the relaxation of this system becomes um, relaxate a shrinking of this volume of this HPD volume. And then if you put um, um, a squid or a magnetometer here, you can watch the NMR signal. Okay, so the signal is like just the precession of these, um, the precession of these, um, these dipole, right? The magnetic dipole. So according to um, Faraday's law, it can induce a current running in this loop and you would just, you just output that current. And this is what you see. The amplitude of the current goes down. Well, because you're moving um, here, right? The llama frequency uh, shrinks as it goes up. No, sorry. Oh, no. So the, the amplitude, do, amplitude is to do with the total magnetization of the system. As it goes up, the, the total magnetization is shrinking, right? So here, you also see a changing in the frequency. And this is to do with, because there's a gradient field here, as you shrink, you're sweeping through different llama frequency, okay? So your llama frequency drifts um, a little away from its initial value as well. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. We thought, well, 
Well, first of all, this was not like none of us, Yoni, none of us are kind of matter theorists. Like, why would we even know this in the first place? Well, because there is this um, um, experimentalist at uh, Northwestern, there are helium three group, and they're like, we have this system. Look at how amazing uh, and coherent the signal is. What can you do with this in dark matter? <laughs> so let's let's say, well, well, let's imagine you can do is dark matter axion, right? Using the axion nucleon coupling. Oh, okay. Right, so here's just, uh, again, that diagram in the pretty, in a, a little cartoon. Right, so what is the effect of axion? Remember, okay, so here, first of all, uh, let's assume a very simplistic, uh, you know, picture of axion. Let's assume it's just pointing in some transverse direction going at a fixed frequency um, MA, okay? So let's say this is the picture I'm taking. So remember, now I'm just periodically injecting magnons into the, the system via the axial nuclear coupling, right? So now the, the, sh the shift or shrinking of this volume, the HV volume, not only depends on T1, but also depends on the magnitude of this axion wind, okay? So if there's no axion, it shrinks like exponentially as T1 roughly. Well, if there's um, um, axion wind, usually this axion frequency and this um, the other cosine term and the sine term to do is lama frequency, these average out over time. However, at special moment when the axial mass matches the lama frequency, the volume will just uh, linearly shrink, okay, or decrease depending on the phase here, actually. So this is when the resonance happens. Notice here I have like a little window, delta ma, because axion, axion dark matter has an uh, intrinsic width as well, okay? So I said when this happens, this goes like, roughly speaking, the change in the volume goes like, the axion effective magnetic field times the axion coherence time. Oops, right, what did I say? Okay, right, so the change in the volume, remember the change in volume will indicate a different frequency. So remember back on this diagram, um, the change of the volume will give me a shift in this frequency because I'm at a different position along the, the vertical B, um, B axis, okay? And this is a signal, a frequency shift. That's what you want to observe. Um, I write it here, the frequency shift is proportional to lama frequency, determined, is determined by the gradient, the change in the gradient across the volume. And um, also, what, oh. There must be a typo here. I don't understand this thing here. Okay, I'll come back to this later. You, um, so what is this? So in terms of numbers, again, let's put in some number, 10 to the minus 10 inverse GV for axial mass around 10 to the minus seven EV was a gradient, a fractional gradient um, field, 0.02. So Basically, this number is told by our experimental colleagues working on these like sort of experiments. Okay, so the frequency shift uh, relative to the initial lama frequency is roughly 10 to the minus 13. Okay, so this is a very, very small number. However, if you talk to some, um, uh, you know, AMO physicists and ask what is the best clock position they can achieve nowadays, um, it's 10 to the minus 17. Okay, so, but of course it has a frequency dependence. So we think this is not completely insane. Um, uh, right. So to uh, see it, like to, to, to get a visual um, sense, this is what you have. Okay, so delta T is at zero is when the resonance happens. Okay, so and these are just 
three different realizations. So these are three simple examples of this axial wind with like different phase. We just assume the phase takes these values. And then we assume a very, very large coupling just so that we can actually see it by eye. So we see is um, before the resonance, there is no, basically there's no effect. But after resonance, the volume uh, will, because it's linear growing, so there is a time, it's sort of linearly growing, but afterwards it sort of uh, goes back to oscillation behavior again. So this linear sort of drift over a small time window is the signal we're looking at. Um, right, so more realistic. So we just said this, um, this past uh, picture we see is a very naive um, picture of axion with some fixed phase and very monochromatic behavior. But we know the axion um, wind, um, first of all, it's, um, it has a distribution and um, depending on the time of the measurement, its direction can change as well, right? So assume a standard model, uh, sorry, assume a standard halo model where your axion um, um, field follows a Gaussian distribution with some cutoff. And if you just compute this X1, so X, um, so I, I call it X here, it's proportional to the gradient of the field, right? So if you just compute this, alone, its expectation should be zero, right? This is not surprising. It's just when you have uh, like a tech pole, like what's the expectation, that's zero. Um, however, if you compute the variance, so this is X1 at T1, X1 T2, and you can plot it. So zero again is at the resonance time, if you plot it, and this is what you see. So roughly you get a, so this is with the standard model, a uh, standard halo model. Um, um, what you see here is again, a similar behavior before the resonance time. Uh, it's very quiet, but afterwards you have a, a oscillation behavior. If you just project it along this diagonal line, this is what you have, okay? Um, so it's slightly different compared to before. We see here, there is a very large amplification. Um, and there is a finite window where this uh, oscillation is sort of, you can probably resolve it depending on how, what is your uh, measurement frequency. But um, after that, you don't really gain, right? So you're back to places where you cannot resolve anything. So this is some, right, just to say, this is some ongoing work and uh, with help with, um, from Josh Foster, he's like a very good, uh, simulate axion simulation um, experts. So hopefully this will be finished soon. Let's see. All right, scan. So we, we said we're talking about axion dark matter. All right, so we want to we want to talk about we want to think about how we are actually covering uh, not just one single axial mass but uh, you know multiple axial masses. Well luckily we said because the lama frequency will drift while this um, experiments um, decay, well, or this domain decays. So while depending on what is your chosen gradient, you're naturally covering many, many axion masses during one scan. Okay, so I think this is another interesting feature of this setup. It allows you to um, go through multiple axion masses just with one single setup without further um, effort on tuning. Um, a couple of words here. So um, within the coherence time, the number, so your signal gain go, goes like a square root of n, where n is number of measurements. But if you're repeating experiments um, many, many times, and then it goes beyond the coherence time, so you, your gain is um, limited. Okay, number of measurements to the fourth. Um, right here, to get this, we assume the noise is uh, just a short noise. Um, just to wrap up, um, here we see uh, we show three um, different scenarios going from conservative to more ambitious. Okay, so this is for um, for example here we assume T one is ten second with ten cc um, helium three, um, 
uh, B field, oh, so B field can never be bigger than 0.55 Tesla. So this is another restriction, a sort of a restriction for the experiment, because if you're too big, you destabilize the superfluid phase. So, um, and you do the experiments 10 minutes. So each round, each, each experiment is lasting 10 seconds, not bigger than the T1. Okay, so uh, you get this um, black curve, which is just probing um, the area where neutron star cooling is not covered. So going more ambitious, you can cover more region. So basically um, there is another, the, again, the issue is like, depending on how fast, i.e. wide you want to cover compared to how deep you want to cover. And you can control this by um, choosing the gradient, right? The B, B field gradient in this uh, experiment. Okay, so I'll just stop here and open for questions. Thanks a lot, Pristina. So any questions from the audience here? No questions. <laughs> Oh, do I, is that good? Is that, that on? No, no, I have to do a thing. Okay, so I, I, I'm looking at this plot, and this axion really on coupling on the y axis, and there's a pretty narrow band of the axion. Isn't there, isn't there a lot more freedom? Or is that a particular QCD axis? Um, you mean this? Can you repeat the question? The so question well? is, why is the band of the QC axiom so um, narrow on this plot? Um, yeah, in principle, it could be wider. I think when I plot this, I just choose the one of the QCD axiom model. Um, it, one of them, I don't even remember. The name. <laughs> I just choose a typical one to indicate that's roughly where it should be. And the point is to show sort of, this is um, at this axion mass, we're still very far away from QC axion. So our other experiments. So yeah, that's the point. Other questions? Thanks. So I, I didn't quite get, what's the advantage of using this kind of unusual phase mm -hmm. instead yeah, so, of just regular yeah, NMR? Uh, regular NMR has the dephasing, which is um, the limiting factor. So remember, when you go beyond the coherence, your signal gain SNR scales like number measurements to one fourth. Sure. So if you have a smaller dephasing time, you're quickly entering that regime where this setup has a longer coherence time, if you like. Right. So you are less limited in okay. that sense. This is one advantage. The other is saying like, cause you, the other experiments uh, like a normal um, Casper, for example, the original idea, if you want to target one axial mass, you have to stabilize your B field around that axial mass, right? Whereas this experiment it naturally allows a small gradient so you're actually covering a range of axial masses in this experiment without worrying about stabilizing the magnitude of B field. Okay. But it seems, I mean, based on the figure, it seems comparable to Casper wind anyway. Mm -hmm. Based on the figure, it seems comparable to Casper wind anyway. Yeah. So that's right. why, I mean, yeah. Right. So we're, so you can always do better, right? That, this highly depends on what are the, um, you know, allowed, feasible experimental parameters. So here, I think this first one, 1,000 second, this is, so first of all, T1, there's no theory prediction for it. And people have to actually do experiments to um, measure what is T1. So 1,000 seconds is allowed, is, is doable. People can achieve it. So volume, this is a big factor. So we know there's only so much helium-3. If you look up how much uh, helium-3 is around in the world, um, 100 cc 
is actually quite a lot, but not, let's say it's not a fan, like a fantasy, it's still allowed. B field is actually one of the restricting factor, right? Because I said the B field cannot be very large, otherwise you destroy the space. So it can only be smaller. Um, so that's why you see I'm manually changing the B field to cover a different range. Right, so yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks. There's a question on the question. Yeah. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Should Sorry. I ask my question now? So I think that the coherence time is much longer than in the standard, what you call the standard halo model, mm -hmm. like a Q of order 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, or even more. Right. How would that affect your sensitivity? Yeah, so you're right. So not so basically there are three time scales, right? There is the T2 in the normal ones, and there is the axion coherence time. So normally you compare the T2 as the axion coherence time, and which one is shorter, so the limit your sensitivity. So here T2 is not a factor. So we're basically limited by the axion coherence time. You're right. But with the detailed simulation, um, So here, so actually on this picture was the, yeah, this doesn't really show you what is the coherence time here. So this is going, the axion resonance at five. So with my particular choice, I think the coherence time is like 0 0.05 second. But on here, this picture, you, you see there's like features, um, you know, with a time window longer than 0 0.05 second. And this is because even, oh, here. Yeah, here, right? So even when you're slightly different, there are features called beats that you can use to distinguish your signal. But if they're you know, too far away, these beats don't show up as well, right? They average out. So you have a time window that is effective where everything is sort of coherent, a little bigger than axion coherence time. And that's what we found in the, you know, ongoing work where the simulations are being run. Did you say T1 was not measured yet? Did T1, you T1 is much longer than any time here. So T1 is above 10 seconds at least. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Can you, There's, yeah. can you again explain the connection between HPD and Axia and why we can look for the different mass ranges? So the connection between HPD and axion is through axion nucleon coupling. The axion going um, interact with the spin of the helium three, and so the axion dark matter acts as an effective magnetic field, um, which is why we can do NMR experiment. Why we can look for the different mass ranges because we can physically tune the magnetic field from 0 0.55 Tesla downward. Does that answer the question? Okay, any more questions? Yes, I'm wondering about the elementary process of the interaction of the action with the nucleon because there are also nuclear resonances that would couple strongly and would uh, introduce large corrections to the coupling, to the action nucleon coupling. For instance, the Delta 1232, which uh, could give you easily corrections of 30, 40% that in the probability is around 80% from so, the level. So your question is, what if the um, helium-3 self-interaction is very strong, so it destabilizes the system? I mean, more than the, the, you have the action interacting with a nucleon, mm -hmm. and then you can excite uh, or well, the nucleon, uh, I think you could excite a, a nuclear resonance, and then you, yes, some kind of self interactions. Yeah. Um, I don't quite get the question. So but action a... nucleon going to a delta, and then delta change a pion with another nucleon in the in the helium. Right, right. So here we're in a superfluid phase, so we're like the the temperature is like below millikelvin, so thermal noise is thermal excitation is negligible. So there's no like basically. We, the only thing we have is like a K equals zero magna mode. There's no other modes in this system. 
Yeah. More questions in the room or by Zoom? If not, let's thank Christina and all the speakers.